Chapter 4. When was the relation of the mystery of the one body given, it is contended by Bullingerites, and others of like ilk, that Paul did not receive the revelation of the mystery of the one body until he was imprisoned in Rome, 63 AD. Generally, too, the ground is taken that this revelation was given to him alone, and that the twelve knew nothing of it. Let us see if these assertions will stand the test of Holy Scripture. We shall turn, first of all, directly to the writings of the Apostle Paul, and examine the passages in which he refers to this subject. The first one is found in the Epistle to the Romans which was written, according to the best authorities, in the year AD 60, at least three years before Paul's imprisonment, and certainly some time before he reached Rome, as in that letter he tells the Romans that he is contemplating the visit to them, and asks them to pray that it might be a prosperous one. It might seem as though his prayer was not answered in as much as he reached Rome in chains, a prisoner, for the gospel's sake. But God's ways are not ours, and we can be sure that in the light of eternity, we shall see that this was indeed one of the most prosperous voyages that anyone ever made. Now in closing this epistle to the Romans, the Apostle says in chapter 16, verses 25 to 27, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, Note that it is my gospel. Paul uses that term in Romans 2 verse 16, Romans 16 verse 25, and 2 Timothy 2 verse 8. No one else uses that term in scripture, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets. According to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, to God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Here we have the plain statement that Paul's preaching throughout the years had been in accordance with the revelation of the mystery previously kept secret, but at that time made manifest. Yes. The mystery was revealed to Paul in Acts 9. In Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12, Paul says that the gospel he preached is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17 that, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Paul also says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 16 that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Therefore, we can conclude that Paul preached a gospel not previously revealed to anyone else, and that that gospel came directly from Jesus Christ. Moreover, he intimates that it had been already published abroad in writing, for he says, it is made manifest, not exactly by the scriptures of the prophets, as though he referred to Old Testament prophets, but by prophetic writings, that is, his own and others. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37 that if any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, the scriptures of the prophets refers to writings confirmed by prophets as scripture. Since only Paul wrote about the mystery, the specific scriptures Paul is referring to would have to be his writings alone. And this proclamation of the mystery had been made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Does anyone ask, how can any ultra-dispensationalist dare to say in the face of such a scripture as this, that the mystery had not been made known and had not been previously preached before Paul was imprisoned at Rome? The mystery was made known in Acts 9, not after Acts 28. If a simple believing Christian, he will probably be amazed at the answer. Dr. Bullinger and others who follow him suggest that in all likelihood the last three verses Of the epistle to the Romans were not written by Paul when he sent the letter from some distant Gentile city, but that they were appended to the letter after he reached Rome and received the new revelation. That cannot be true, because there is no note in the epistle that this is so. Without that note, it makes God out to be a liar, by saying that Paul wrote the entire epistle, when he did not. Furthermore, if someone did add three verses to the end of Romans, they would have deleted verse 24 so that you would not know that they had added the verses. This is man trying to discredit God's word. The reason Paul adds these three verses at the end is to mention the mystery, so that you will be familiar with that term when you read more advanced mystery doctrine in Ephesians. Is this unbelievable? Nevertheless, it is exactly what these men teach. 
It is higher criticism of the worst type and impugns the perfection of the Word of God. Yes, it goes against Scripture to believe in Acts 28 position. For, even supposing their contentions were true, how absurd it would be for Paul to add these words after he reached Rome, to an epistle purporting to be written before he got there. And how senseless it would be for him to speak while he was in prison, of a gospel and a revelation which he was supposed to have preached in all the world, if he had never yet begun that proclamation. Needless to say, the contention of Dr. Bullinger is an absolute fabrication. It is the special pleading of a heart-driven controversialist, bound to maintain his unscriptural system at all costs, even to destroying the unity of the Word of God. Ironside uses these same tactics in this paper. Error is never consistent, and even the astute Bullinger has overlooked the fact that earlier in this very epistle, Paul declares the truth of the one body just as clearly and definitely as he does in Ephesians or any later letter. Notice particularly Romans 12 verses 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and everyone members one of another. Could we have a clearer declaration than this of the truth of the mystery? This is part of the mystery. What ultra-dispensationalist will dare to say that this passage is an interpolation added in after years in order to make Romans fit with Ephesians? God's word is perfect and always exact. These unspiritual theorists invariably overlook something that completely destroys their unscriptural hypotheses. When then did Paul get this revelation of the truth of the one body? He tells us he had been preaching it throughout the world among all nations. The answer clearly is, he received it at the time of his conversion, when he cried in amazement, Who art thou, Lord? And the glorified Savior answered, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. This was the revelation of the mystery. Ironside just said that the body of Christ is the mystery. Now, he says that the mystery is that Jesus is Lord. Make up your mind, Ironside. By the time we get to Acts 9, there is nothing mysterious about Jesus being Lord. Peter said, in Acts 2 verse 36, that God had made Jesus both Lord and Christ. The result of the gospel, given in Acts 2 verse 38, was that 3,000 souls were saved, Acts 2 verse 41. Therefore, there are thousands of people who know that Jesus is Lord, before that truth was revealed to Paul in Acts 9. Paul says that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all long-suffering, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. Paul was not saved until one year after Acts 2. Therefore, the mystery cannot be that Jesus is Lord. This verse in Acts 9 is just the revelation to Paul that Jesus is Lord. It is not the mystery. The mystery is that all people, both Jews and Gentiles, may receive God's gift of eternal life through grace by simply trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins. Do not try to say that this is the message that Peter preached. Peter preached Jesus' death, all right, but he preached it as bad news, not good news. Peter said, Ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, Acts 2 verse 23. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ, Acts 2 verse 36. Peter said that wicked Israel crucified the Lord. That is bad news to Israel. The good news is to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38. It is not trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of sins. Also, let us be careful to say that believing that Jesus is Lord is not the gospel. James 2 verse 19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Revelation 6 verses 16 to 17 says that the world says, Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Understanding that Jesus is Lord is a good thing, but you must trust in his death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins in order to have eternal life. Now, regarding the truth of the one body, we do not know when Paul received it. But he must have received it before he wrote Romans, which was written, as Ironside mentions, before the end of Acts. That is a problem for the Acts 28 dispensationalists, but not for us mid-Acts dispensationalists. 
The Axe 28 position is just as wrong as the Axe 2 position is. In that announcement our Lord declared that every Christian on earth is so indissolubly linked up with Him as the glorified head in heaven, that everything done against one of them is felt by the head. Jesus said, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Matthew 25 verse 40. Therefore, Jesus identifies the little flock of Israel as his brothers, not his body. Since the body of Christ is for the mystery dispensation only, it is only in Paul's writings where we see the link between the head and the body. For example, Colossians 2 verse 19 says, Not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered, and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. The little flock of Israel and Jesus do not have this body slash head relationship. This is, the mystery members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. If the mystery is the body of Christ, as Ironside claims, and the mystery was not revealed until Paul, then how were Peter and all those saved between Acts 2 to 7 part of the body of Christ? And moreover, this is an exact accord with certain statements elsewhere made in the book of Acts. For instance, in chapter 5, verse 14, we read, And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. Believers were added to the Lord in the Old Testament, too. It does not mean they are part of his body. Upon marriage, the bride, Israel, becomes one flesh with the bridegroom. Therefore, Israel can be joined to the Lord as part of the bride, without being his body. This was before Paul's conversion. Observe it does not simply say that they were added to the company of believers, nor even added to the assembly alone, but they were added to the Lord. This is only by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is not true. If that is the case, then all believers before Acts 2 will go to the lake of fire, because the baptism of the Holy Spirit did not occur until Acts 2. Sorry, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, etc., you were born too early to have eternal life. Ironside says you cannot be added to the Lord, even though God says you have eternal life, because you did not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, then, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not required for someone to have eternal life. In fact, Old Testament prophecy specifically says that it is not until the last days that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, Joel 2 verse 28. Quite in keeping with this, when we turn to chapter 11, 22-24, we read concerning the character and ministry of Barnabas that, he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people were added unto the Lord. In the mystery dispensation, saved individuals are the body of Christ. In the prophecy dispensation, saved Israel is the bride of Christ. When a husband and wife are married, the two, Become one flesh, Ephesians 5 verse 31. As such, whether you are part of the body or the bride, you are part of the Lord. Again, the body of Christ is only mentioned by Paul in his letters, because it is only part of the mystery dispensation, Romans 7 verse 4, I Corinthians 10 16, 12 27, Ephesians 4 verse 12. Now no one was ever added to the Lord in any other way than by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Again, how does Ironside come to this conclusion? Genesis 15 verse 6 says that, Abram, believed in the Lord, and, God, counted it to him, for righteousness. Yet, we are never told of Abram receiving the Holy Spirit. So, I guess he is lost forever. See how ridiculous Ironside's statement is? So that clearly we have the body of Christ here in the Acts, although the term itself is not used. Someone can be added to the Lord as his bride without being added to the Lord as his body. When we turn to 1 Corinthians, the only epistle which gives us divine order for the regulation of the affairs of the churches of God here on earth, where does Irons come up with that idea? I and 2 Timothy and Titus are the epistles of Paul, specifically written for church order. 1 Corinthians corrects bad behavior as a result of not following Romans doctrine. I and 2 Timothy and Titus talk about bishops, deacons, widows, young men, old men, young women, and old women. You do not find any of this in 1 Corinthians. We have the plain statement of this mystery as we have already seen, in chapter 12, colon 12-14. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. 
For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. It is absurd to say, as these ecclesiastical hobby writers do, that the body referred to here is not the same thing as the body of Ephesians and Colossians. It is a body made up of those who formerly were Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, but are now all one in Christ. And this body has been formed by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In no other way was the body of Christ brought into existence. Yes, that is what the passage says. If you believe that the body of Christ started with Paul in Acts 9, there will not be two bodies, and everything becomes clear. Objection has been raised that when the Apostle goes on to apply practically the truth of our responsibility as members of the body in our relation to each other, he uses the illustration of the eye and ear as members of the head, which, they tell us, he could not use if he thought of Christ as the head of the body, and was thinking of believers as one body with him. The eye and ear are just used as illustrations of body parts we can relate better to. It does not mean that believers are the head. Only Christ is the head. But he tells us distinctly in the previous chapter that the head of every man is Christ. This could only be said of those who were linked with him in this hallowed fellowship and members of this divine organism. The great difference, of course, between the body as presented in Corinthians and as in Ephesians is this. The body in Ephesians embraces all saints living or dead as to the flesh, from Pentecost to the rapture, whereas the body in Corinthians embraces all saints upon the earth at any given time. Huh? Ironside continues to make statements of belief without providing any scriptural support for his statements. He just criticized Acts 28 heirs for believing there are two bodies of Christ, and then Ironside turns right around and states that he believes there are two bodies of Christ. How ridiculous is that? Both 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 and Ephesians 4 verse 4 state that there is one body. But, according to Ironside, I am in both bodies of Christ, because I was born between Pentecost and the Rapture, while Old Testament saints are only in one body of Christ. Scene. Thus in the place of responsibility, it is quite in keeping that the Apostle would use the illustration that he does. It is in vain for these ultra-dispensationalists to fight against responsibility. There is no fighting against responsibility by right dividers. Israel is one flesh with Christ due to being his bride. The body of Christ is one flesh with Christ due to being his body. Both are responsible to Christ. Recently I overheard a leader among them make this statement. Whenever you get commandments of any kind, you are on Jewish ground, and you have given up grace. Yet in every epistle of the New Testament, we have commandments and exhortations insisting upon the believer's responsibility to recognize the government of God in this way. Scripture does not agree with this statement. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37 says that Paul's epistles are the commandments of the Lord. In Israel's dispensation, they are under the law. Today, we are not under the law but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14. Today, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8 verse 2. Thus, we are under the law of the Spirit, rather than the law of the flesh. Therefore, commandments today are of a different nature than the Mosaic law, but we still have commandments. Grace and government are not opposing principles, but are intimately linked together. Grace and works are mutually exclusive, not grace and government. And, if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Romans 11 verse 6. With regard to grace and government, Ephesians 2 verse 8 says we are saved by grace, and Ephesians 1 verses 20 to 23 talks about Christ using the body of Christ to fill the governmental structure in heaven. Therefore, they are not opposing principles. Ironside fails to recognize that government and commandments are two different things. He who refuses the truth of responsibility does not thereby magnify grace, but rather is in danger of turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and becomes practically an antinomian, throwing off all restraint, professing to be saved by grace, but refusing to recognize the claims of Christ. Those who put
themselves back under the law, are the ones refusing the truth of responsibility. Galatians 4 verse 7 says, Thou art no more a servant, but a son. As adult sons, God has given us the responsibility to read God's word ourselves and let the Holy Spirit teach it to us, using the mind of Christ as a guide, rather than our flesh. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. Ironside expects us to be guided by the hand, by God, as a child would be. The difference is akin to the difference between college and high school. In college, you learn more and use it to work for a living. In high school, you learn less. College professors treat you like an adult. If you do not show up for class or do not study, they will give you an F and have no problem doing so. High school teachers make sure you are in class and spoon feed you what you need to know. There is more responsibility in a college class because you have to have your own motivation to do the work. Similarly, when you are under the law, God spoon feeds you what you can and cannot do. Under grace, it is up to you to read the Bible, believe it, and allow the Holy Spirit to work through your life. You can choose not to do this and suffer the adverse consequences, or you can follow this growth plan and come into the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. The fact that God treats you like an adult in grace, instead of a child under the law, shows that there is more responsibility in grace than there is in law, just like there is more responsibility in college than there is in high school. Coming back then to consider the passage in 1 Corinthians, we have the truth of the body clearly set forth and are shown how it was brought into existence in a letter written at least four years before Paul's imprisonment, and he writes that letter to a group of believers who had been brought to a knowledge of Christ through his preaching some years before. To them he says in verses 26, 27, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Verse 26 only emphasizes what we have referred to above, that here we have the body in the place of responsibility on earth. Members in heaven do not suffer. All members on earth do. But it is objected again that in the Greek, there is no definite article before the word body, and therefore the passage should simply read, Now ye are a body of Christ, and so we are told this refers only to a local church. No. There is only one body of Christ, Ephesians 4 verse 4. It includes all people saved during the mystery dispensation, which begins with Paul in Acts 9. This does not touch the question. Every local church in apostolic days was the body of Christ representatively in that place. It would be so today if it were not for the fact that so many unsaved people have been received into the membership of the local churches. According to the word of God, there was only the one body, and in any city where the gospel had been preached and believed, that body could be found as a local company. That is true, provided that the church is part of the dispensation of grace. If saved before then, they are part of the Bride of Christ. When we pass on to 2 Corinthians, we find the same precious truth ministered by the Apostle long before he was imprisoned at Rome. He tells us, in chapter 5, colon 16, 17, Wherefore henceforth know we man after the flesh, yet though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, or literally, this is a new creation old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Could words more plainly set forth the truth of the mystery than these? Old relationships ended and every believer brought into a new place altogether before God, and a new condition, so that Christ is now his head, and he a member of the new creation. First, being a new creature does speak of the body of Christ. I find it interesting that Ironside, who is trying to say this is referring to the body of Christ, would change creature, creation, which leads one away from recognizing the body here. Second, if Ironside is emphasizing the new place altogether. Before God, he is emphasizing something that Israel, as born-again believers, have, as well. In other words, the new creature is distinctly mystery doctrine, while a right standing before God is possible in all dispensations. However, this is not what the passage is talking about. Rather, it is talking about how we, as new creatures in Christ, are to view others spiritually, rather than physically. And this was part of the preaching that the Apostle had been declaring wherever he went during all the years of his ministry. 
We turn next to Galatians, a letter written, according to the best authority we have, a year earlier than Corinthians, and the ultra-dispensationalists are very sure that when Paul speaks of being baptized into Christ in this letter, there can be no reference to water baptism, but that he refers solely to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Being baptized into Christ means being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Only a spiritual baptism could baptize us into Christ, as salvation does not come by water, even though it was a condition of the previous dispensation. If one could put on Christ by being water baptized into Christ, salvation is by the work of baptism, not by the work of Jesus' death and resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, Paul says, By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Earlier in that epistle, he said, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 14. If water baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit into Christ's body, then Paul would not have thanked God that he only baptized a few of them. He would have been baptizing everyone. Romans 6 verses 3 to 4 explains that we are baptized into Christ's death, meaning that, once we are saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the death of Christ so that we may be raised to life in his resurrection. Romans 6 verse 5. Since Ephesians 4 verse 5 says that there is only one baptism today, we must conclude that God does not recognize water baptism today. I am not in agreement with them on this, but allowing for the moment that they are correct, they notice where it puts their theory. Note carefully chapter 3, 26 to 29. For ye are all the children, sons, of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Here again, we are distinctly told that all the children of faith, Abraham's seed spiritually, are sons of God, and that all such as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, nor any of the other distinctions according to nature, but all are one in him. Unknowingly, Ironside has just proven that the baptism of Galatians 3 verse 27 must be spirit baptism, not water baptism. Since there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, Galatians 3 verse 28, for those who have been baptized into Christ, if this is water baptism, then these distinctions must be done away with physically. Yet, we clearly see that Christians are still male and female in the flesh. Therefore, this must be a spirit baptism, not a fleshly baptism. Is there anything in Revelation of the mystery as given in Ephesians or Colossians that goes beyond this? There is advanced doctrine in Ephesians and Colossians, but what is said in Galatians is also true of the body of Christ today. It is a clear definite statement of the absolute unity in Christ of those who before their conversion occupied different positions here on earth, some being Jews, some Gentiles, some free men, some slaves, some men, some women, but every distinction now obliterated in the new creation. That is true, spiritually speaking only. Why, then, does Ironside think that water baptism, which pertains only to the flesh, would accomplish the doing away of these spiritual distinctions? Also, note that Israel is not told that they are part of the new creature. Rather, they are born again, John 3 verse 3. They are born again as Christ's bride, rather than being part of the new creature, which is the body of Christ. If any are foolish enough to object, as some have, that Abraham's seed is altogether different from the body of Christ, Abraham's seed is not only the body of Christ. God tells us that Abraham's seed is Christ, Galatians 3 verse 16. This includes both his bride, Israel, and his body, mystery gospel believers. Duh. Then we turn to Ephesians itself, the epistle which they claim, above all others supports their unscriptural theory, and find their entire position is there completely disallowed. In the first chapter of this glorious epistle, the apostle reminds the Ephesians of things that they have learned through his ministry in days gone by. There is no hint that he is opening up to them something new, but he simply puts down in writing for permanent use, precious things already dear to them. In Ephesians 1 verse 18, Paul prays that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He does want them to learn some new information. 
This new information is of the governmental structure in heaven that the body of Christ will fill. Ephesians 1 verses 20 to 23, because they are in Christ, seated together with him in heavenly places. Ephesians 2 verses 5 to 6. If the information is not new, then why is he writing it to them? We do not learn about the body of Christ occupying positions in heavenly places until we get to Ephesians 1. He reminds them that they have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ, that they have been chosen in him before the foundation of the world in order that they might be holy and without blame before him, that in love, he has predestinated them unto the place of sons by Christ Jesus, having taken them into favor in the beloved. Theirs is redemption through his blood, sins all forgiven according to the riches of his grace, and to them he has abounded in all wisdom and prudence, having made known the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, see there, 3 to 9. Reminds them, much of this information is new to them. He points them on to the full consummation of this mystery when in the administration, not administration, but dispensation. The dispensation of the fullness of times, Ephesians 1 verse 10, is when God dispenses the exceeding riches of his grace, Ephesians 2 verse 7, to all believers in heavenly and earthly realms by having all of those things being gathered in Christ. Thus, it is not just an administration, but a dispensing, of the completed seasons, that is, the last dispensation, he will head up in one all things in Christ, both heavenly and earthly, and he reminds them that, We have already obtained an inheritance in him, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things according to the counsel of his own will. We need to notice the pronouns used in verses 12 and 13. He first speaks of converts from Israel, when he says that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Then he refers to the Gentiles, such as these Ephesians had been, when in the next verse he says, there is no mention of Jews or Gentiles in these verses. Rather, it mentions that there were people in the body of Christ before the Ephesians. These would have been both Jew and Gentile, especially in light of the fact that Ephesians 2 verse 14 says that the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile has been broken down. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Now observe carefully, he is far from intimating that he is at this time unveiling something of which they had never heard before. He carries them back in memory to the hour of their conversion, and declares that these things were true of them then. Yes, these things were true of them in the hour of their conversion. Paul is building the foundation of who they are in Christ so that they will understand the new information given to them, beginning in 118, that Christ will fill the heavenly places with the church, the body of Christ. And, because of this, he prays that they may have deeper understanding, not of new truth about to be revealed, but of blessed and wonderful things already made known. Obviously, the Ephesians did not know these truths. Otherwise, Paul would not have prayed that ye may know, Ephesians 1 verse 18. Paul is giving them new information about the heavenly places so that they may know who they are in Christ so that they will serve Christ in that manner. In the second chapter, he deals specifically with the new creation, reminding them in verse 12 that they in time past were Gentiles. who were called uncircumcision, and were in themselves, without Christ and aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and literally atheists in the world. Paul does not say that the Ephesians were atheists. Without God in the world, Ephesians 2 verse 12, just means that they did not have eternal life yet. It does not mean that they thought that God does not exist. But now they have been made nigh, the blood of Christ. The result is that they became members of that same body into which their converted Jewish brethren had already been assimilated. What Ironside is doing is that he is saying that Ephesians 1 verse 12 refers to Jews so that he can say that the body of Christ stood in Acts 2 because that is when Jews began to be converted. The problem with this argument is that, in Ephesians 1 verse 12, Paul uses the word we, which means Paul is included. But, back in Acts 2, Paul was a blasphemer and a persector, 
and injurious, 1 Timothy 1 verse 13. Paul is the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because, he, persecuted the church of God, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9. When God called Paul in Acts 9, Paul was called so that in, him, first Jesus Christ might shew forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him, to life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. Therefore, by Paul saying we in Ephesians 1 verse 12, he is referring to the group he belongs to, which is are the believers in the body of Christ, who were all saved in Acts 9 and after. Notice carefully verses 14 to 18. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. The distinction between Jew and Gentile was abolished in the cross, not after Paul's imprisonment in Rome. The middle wall of partition, Ephesians 2 verse 14, is the wall between Jew and Gentile. It is not the veil in the temple that was torn in two when Christ died, Matthew 27 verse 51. The middle wall was broken down when God stopped treating Israel with favored nation status, which we have already seen occurred with the call of Paul in Acts 9. If it was abolished at the cross, the little flock would not have gone to Israel alone before Acts 9. From that time on all who believed were brought into the body of Christ through the one spirit of verse 18. What were the means used to effect this? The answer is in Ephesians 2 verse 8 that by grace are you saved through faith. They received this faith of Christ by believing the gospel that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3-4. Jesus did not tell the eleven apostles to teach that gospel. He told them to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, Matthew 28 verse 20. These things would include the Mosaic law, as Matthew 23 verses 2-3 says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Therefore, the body of Christ could not have started before Acts 9, because a different gospel was being taught that did not have the power to bring people into the body of Christ, even if they believed it. The preaching recorded in the book of Acts, for it is only that to which he can possibly refer, when he says, verses 16, 17, Paul said that he received the gospel that he preached by the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verse 12. Paul said that what he preached was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16 verse 25. By contrast, Peter said that the message he preached, God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, Acts 3 verse 21. Therefore, we must be careful to note that Paul is only referring to his preaching in Acts, not to Peter's preaching. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. It was necessary that the message should first go to them that were nigh, as it did in the early chapters of Acts, first, we must note that Romans 3 verse 2 tells us that the Jews had the oracles of God. Therefore, Ironside is correct in saying that the Jews were nigh, while the Gentiles were afar off. However, he is not correct in saying that the gospel of grace went to Jews in Acts 1 to 7. In fact, Peter preaches a message of repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38. The gospel of grace was not revealed until given to the apostle Paul in Acts 9. Therefore, the gospel of grace going to them that were nigh did not take place in the first seven chapters of Acts. It only took place through Paul's ministry. This is clear when we read Acts 9-28, to because those chapters show Paul giving the mystery gospel to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. If the early chapters of Acts took care of the ministry to the Jews, Paul never would have gone to the Jews in his ministry, but Jesus specifically commissioned Paul to Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, Acts 9 verse 15, and then to those that were afar off. But the result of that preaching was that all who believed were reconciled to God in one body.
In the last four verses of the chapter he shows the unity of the church from the beginning. The church is the household of God. It is also a great building, and he declares, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, New Testament prophets, course, not New Testament prophets, Ironside, but body of Christ prophets. Ephesians 4 verse 11 specifically says that after his ascension to heaven, Jesus gave some apostles and some prophets. They were given till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4 verse 13. These are body of Christ prophets that were given until the word of God. was completed with Paul's writings. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth, note the tense, it is not yet completed, it is still in process of construction, but it is growing, that's because people are still being saved, unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. How blind must he be who can see in such a passage as this, disassociation of the Ephesian saints from the work which God began at Pentecost, since the mystery was made known to Paul by Jesus Christ, Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 3, and it was not made known in other ages, Ephesians 3 verse 5, how blind Ironside must be in not seeing these verses and trying to include early Acts believers in a program that no man knew would even exist. Also, why does Ironside disassociate the work at Pentecost with the work of God before that, especially since, when the Holy Ghost comes, Peter says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, Acts 2 verse 16. Does not this one statement confirm that God did not start something new at Pentecost, but that he was continuing the prophecy program, and that program was now entering a new phase, as prophesied in Joel? Therefore, the reason there is a disassociation with Paul's ministry is because it was something new, which was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16 verse 25, while there is no disassociation between Acts 2 and the previous scriptures, because what Peter preached was merely a continuation of the prophecy program, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, Acts 3 verse 21. They are builded into the same temple and rest upon the same foundation. Even Ironside says that Paul, in Ephesians 2 verse 20, is speaking of New Testament prophets. Therefore, by Ironside's own admission, he believes that the foundation of Acts Revelation is on New Testament prophets, completely disassociating with the Old Testament prophets. Ironside provides no basis for making such an assertion. Yet, I have given scripture that shows that God started a new program with the Apostle Paul, and yet Ironside expects us to believe him, instead of believing God's word. This is made even clearer in the next chapter, where Paul gives us probably the fullest information concerning the one body that we have anywhere in the New Testament, and, therefore, we must devote considerable time and space to it. First, he tells us that he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ because of the Gentiles, and he explains that in the next few verses, it was his devotion to the revelation of the mystery which is part of the dispensation of the grace of God that resulted in his imprisonment. Paul is the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. That does not mean that Paul was imprisoned in a physical prison by Gentiles. Acts records that Jews were the cause of his imprisonments. Rather, a dispensation of the gospel has been committed unto him, and he is obligated by Jesus Christ to preach it. 1 Corinthians 9 verses 16 to 17. As such, he is the spiritual prisoner of Jesus Christ to preach the gospel of the grace of God to the Gentiles, as the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. He did not get this dispensation after he was in prison. Then he insists that this revelation was not made in previous ages unto the sons of men, that is, it was not made known in Old Testament times. But he tells us it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Again, there goes Ironside, creating a separation between the Old and New Testaments that is not there. We have already seen that the term apostles and prophets in Ephesians 2 verse 20 is defined by Paul in Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 13 as those given by the Lord Jesus Christ to his body for this dispensation. 
This would have to be after Acts 8, since the mystery was revealed to Paul first, and Paul was a blasphemer before Acts 9. Therefore, his holy apostles and prophets have to be those of the mystery dispensation, which would not include the apostles and prophets in the New Testament before then. Now if I believed in overemphasis as some do, I should like to print these words in very bold type, he should have put the scripture in bold. Then, maybe his readers would believe God's word, instead of Ironside's false doctrine, but to do so would be an insult to the intelligence of my readers. I simply desire to ask their most careful attention to these words. It is because of our careful attention to these words that we recognize that God started something new with the Apostle Paul, because we carefully note the words which in other ages was not made known, Ephesians 3 verse 5. The Bullingerites tell us that the mystery was only made known to the Apostle Paul, not to other Apostles. The Mystery was made known to Paul first, since he received his gospel by the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verse 12, and he specifically calls it my gospel, Romans 16 verse 25. However, other apostles in the mystery dispensation received the mystery after him. We need to get out of the mindset that God only chose 12 apostles, because Ephesians 4 verses 8 to 14 specifically says that Jesus Christ gave the body of Christ apostles after his ascension to heaven. The Apostle himself tells us here that it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. Note not only the plural, but that others besides apostles had this revelation. How utterly absurd would words like these be if he were referring to something that had just been secretly made known to him? But is it true that other apostles and prophets had already known the mystery? It is. This he declares in these words, No. Paul said that it is now revealed to others. It does not say that they heard the mystery before Paul did. If they did, then why did Jesus Christ have to give it to Paul by a special revelation? Why didn't Ananias tell it to him when he came in Acts 9 to heal Paul's blind eyes, especially when God now wants all men to see what is the fellowship of the mystery, Ephesians 3 verse 9. What is that mystery? Verse 6 is the answer, that the Gentile should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So, if the mystery is the body of Christ and it was not revealed until given to Paul, then how could early Acts believers be part of the body of Christ? Thus they too become Abraham's seed, because they are children of faith. The mystery then is not simply centered in the term body, but whatever expression may be used, the mystery is that during the present age all distinction between believing Jews and believing Gentiles is done away in. Christ. Yes, this is part of the mystery. What Ironside is missing is that the present dispensation did not start until Paul in Acts 9, for Peter clearly said that, the information that he spoke, God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, Acts 3 verse 21. Therefore, we must conclude that Peter's message belongs to a previous dispensation, in which the distinction between believing Jews and believing Gentiles is not done away with. That is why Jesus said that salvation is of the Jews, John 4 verse 22. That is also why these twelve Jesus sent forth, and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6. Clearly, Jesus still made a distinction between the Jews and Gentiles, and this distinction was carried out by the twelve apostles in early Acts until God began a new dispensation with Paul in Acts 9. Was this mystery made known by other servants besides the Apostle Paul? It was. The Apostle John makes it known in his account of our Lord's ministry as given in the tenth chapter of his Gospel. There we read that the Lord Jesus, as the Good Shepherd, entered into the sheepfold of Judaism to lead his own out into glorious liberty. And cryptically he adds, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. This is perhaps the earliest intimation of the mystery that we have. What? In John 4, Jesus went to the Samaritans. They were Jews, but not of this fold. In John 7 verse 35, we are told of Jews dispersed among the Gentiles. Therefore, the other sheep are those Jews. 
Jesus calls them the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verse 24. Since they are lost, they are not of this fold. God said in Leviticus 26 verse 33 that he would scatter Israel among the heathen if they disobeyed the law. He then said in Ezekiel 34 verses 11 to 16 that he would search my sheep and seek them out, and I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will. Bring them to their own land, I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be, I will feed my flock, I will seek that which was lost. Since both Ezekiel 34 and John 10 show Jesus as the good shepherd, the one flock and one shepherd of John 10 verse 16 must be referring to the fulfillment of the regathering of Israel into the land, as stated in Ezekiel 34 verses 11 to 16, and not to the mystery, which God was still keeping secret. Romans 16 verse 25, at the time of John 10 verse 16. Since Peter said that the information that he preached had been revealed ever since the world began and Peter stated that in Acts 3, which was after John 10, we must conclude that the mystery had not begun yet in John 10, which means that Jesus could not have revealed the mystery then, because Jesus was the Son of Man, and Ephesians 3 verse 5 says that the mystery was not made known unto the sons of men. That means that Jesus, as the Son of Man, not only did not reveal the mystery to the twelve apostles in John 10, but he did not even know it himself, as the Son of Man. It was not committed to writing, of course, until some years after the epistle to the Ephesians was written. Ironside is saying that John was written after Paul's epistles. However, Colossians 1 verse 25 says that Paul's epistles were written to fulfill the word of God. Therefore, the Gospel of John must have been written before Paul wrote about the mystery and not after, as liberal scholars claim so that they can deny the supernatural aspects of Matthew, John. But it shows us that John, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, had received the revelation of the mystery even before the apostle Paul did. If that were the case, Peter and John would have been preaching the mystery in early Acts, yet we see them continuing Israel's prophecy program. Then what of the Apostle Peter? We dare to say the same mystery was made known to him on the housetop of Simon's residence in Joppa, when he had the vision of the descending sheet from heaven and saw in it all manner of beasts and creeping things, and heard the word from heaven, Peter heard Jesus' statement at John 10 verse 16 at the same time that John did. If John knew the mystery then, why would Peter have to wait one to two years later in Acts 10? before God revealed the mystery to him, and why did John keep the mystery a secret from Peter? Also, why didn't John speak up in Acts 3 verses 12 to 26 and preach the cross as good news, instead of letting Peter preach it as bad news? Obviously, John, Peter, and the rest of the apostles did not know the mystery in early Acts. What God hath cleansed called are not common, or unclean. This statement comes from Acts 10 verse 15. The mystery was revealed to Paul in Acts 9. Therefore, Paul had already received the revelation of the mystery before it was revealed to Peter in Acts 10. God started the mystery. Dispensation with Paul in Acts 9, and Peter needed to know about this change, too. Therefore, God gave Peter the vision of the sheet of meat in Acts 10. This was to him an intimation that in Christ the distinction between Jew and Gentile was henceforth, Yes, henceforth is correct. Not at the cross, as Ironside previously said, or at Acts, too. Rather, the distinction between Jew and Gentile was eliminated with the revelation of the mystery to Paul in Acts 9, to be done away, and he makes it perfectly clear that this was his conviction when he stood up to preach in the household of Cornelius, Acts 10 verse 34 to end. Moreover, his epistles emphasize the same fact, though not in the full, that those of the Apostle Paul do. Where in Peter's epistles does he talk about Jews and Gentiles being equal in God's eyes? I do not see it. In Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, God says, in reference to Israel, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. God also says in Exodus 19 verse 6 that, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. 
According to Ironside, God lied in those passages, and Jews and Gentiles are really equal now. Surely, then, God has learned from his previous mistake and will guide Peter into showing Jews and Gentiles equal in writing his epistles in the New Testament. Yet, 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In continuing the writing, Peter says, in 1 Peter 2 verse 12, that they are to have their conversation honest among the Gentiles. This shows that Peter's audience was Jews. Therefore, Israel was placed by God on a pedestal above the Gentiles in the Old Testament, and they are still on that pedestal in Israel's program in Peter's epistles. Why, then, does Ironside think that Peter's epistles emphasize that Jews and Gentiles are on the same level even after the cross? John and Peter are apostles. Are there any prophets who give evidence of having in measure at least understood this truth? The greatest of all the New Testament prophets is Luke himself, that's funny, because Jesus said in Matthew 11 verses 11 and 13 that there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, because all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Since Ironside elevates Jesus' words in Matthew, John above the rest of the Bible, why would he say Luke is the greatest prophet, since Jesus never even mentioned Luke's name, and in his book of the Acts, the mystery is plainly made known, though not taught doctrinally. Yes, Luke did understand the mystery, and even went with Paul on his apostolic journeys to spread the mystery, but he did not know the mystery before Paul did. The reason the mystery can be seen in Acts is that Luke wrote to Israel, and the mystery gospel went to Israel in Acts 9-28. We see God working in grace to unite Jew and Gentile into one body. Turning back to Ephesians 3, we find in verse 7 that the Apostle tells us that he was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God for the very purpose of making known this mystery. He says in verses 8 and 9, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is the grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. This had been his great responsibility throughout the years. Because of this, he had suffered bitter persecution, on account of which he was even then in prison, but he is the more concerned that after his death there should be left on record such a full statement of this truth that no one could lose sight of it. That is because a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto, Paul, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, as the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. God gave to Paul, and Paul alone, the job of recording mystery doctrine for us to learn today as we read God's word. It is significant to note that the word mystery appears 22 times in scripture once in Mark, 4 times in Revelation, and 17 times in Paul's epistles. Of the five references outside of Paul's epistles, all five are defined in those verses as talking about a different mystery than what was revealed to Paul. If, then, Peter, John, and the other apostles wrote of the mystery, why do they never even mention it?